Hi, I'm Brian with BibleStudying.net, and we've spent the last video talking about all the prominent cases and, and prominent events and figures in, in biblical history, Adam and Noah and Abraham, Moses and Jesus and the Apostles, that demonstrate that Judeo-Christianity has always operated from a foundation of the objective approach to knowledge. Reason applied to facts, objective facts, is the basis for deriving any truth about God or about morality. And within that now emerges the question, what about things like prophetic dreams and visions? These are clearly subjective, and I would agree. They're taking place for the prophet uh, alone. In that person's mind, pretty much no one else is experiencing them. So in that sense, they are very much subjective, and I wouldn't disagree with that. So does that overturn what we're saying? And the answer to that question is no. And the reason we get a no answer is because the foundation itself, the entire system, is laid out based upon objectivity. You might find places or parts where something subjective is occurring, but the system itself is not based upon the, the subjective, it's based upon the objective. Uh, we would not have Judeo-Christianity if Moses hadn't come with this massive demonstration through the plagues to both the Egyptians and the Israelites. Testimony went out across the world that this was the true religion. It was demonstrated in that massive way through the, the signs and the plagues there in Egypt. You wouldn't have Judeo-Christianity if you didn't have Jesus and the apostles with the enormous amount of miracles and supernatural works that they did to provide objective evidence that that message was true. The framework, the foundation of Judeo-Christianity is laid upon objective testimony to the message. At times we may find something subjective, but it's not the basis of the system. In fact, when we have things like prophetic visions or prophetic words that we can describe or qualify as, as subjective, they also not only are based upon an objective system, but they are limited in the sense that they have to come to pass objectively. If Noah had, as we talked about, had this vision or this idea of the flood, but it didn't come to pass for everyone, then it, then it would have been false. Uh, and so prophetic messages have to come to pass objectively. And so from start to finish, both in their in terms of their foundation and their completion, even those subjective components become subjective to objective tests and objective reality. It doesn't in any way overturn the system. Uh, it doesn't overturn the fact that Judeo-Christianity is a system based on objectivity. And so uh, we want to move from there to, to this other question. This other question being, what about Calvinism? Uh, Calvinism is a system of Christianity, it's a particular version of Christianity that I would argue has a subjective approach to knowledge wholesale. It doesn't have just small components that are subjective like prophetic dreams and visions, but its wholesale epistemology is subjective. In fact, I would suggest that I would probably be willing to bet that if a Calvinist is watching this video so far, and they've heard me talk about, even from Romans chapter 1, that the knowledge of God and the morality and theology are all things that could have been and were deduced clearly from the created world that's objectively available to everyone, and that we apply reason to that and get those conclusions, the Calvinist is probably going to uh, really, really object to that. They're going to probably disagree, and they probably might get a little bit irritated at me saying that because of their level of disagreement. So let me back that up a little bit, though. Uh, let, me, let me demonstrate that that is, in fact, what a Calvinist response probably would be, and then also to talk about why I would disagree with the Calvinist response. Uh, so what is Calvinism? Well, it's, it's a Reformed theology. It comes at the Reformation shortly thereafter, started by John Calvin. And I'm not going to get into too many of those basic facts, but let's talk a little bit about what Calvinism believes. And for starters, I want to go back to the definitions of mysticism, because we did those a little while ago. I want those to be fresh in our heads as we look at Calvinism. According to Microsoft and Carter, mysticism was an immediate, direct, intuitive knowledge of God or ultimate reality through personal religious experience. Miriam Webster says it's belief that direct knowledge of God, spiritual truth, or ultimate reality can be attained through subjective experience such as intuition or insight. And Encyclopedia Britannica said that mysticism is the third kind of knowledge, the other two being sense knowledge and knowledge by inference. Now, inference here is just a synonym for reason. So sense knowledge being use your eyes, your ears, and you detect the facts around you, inference being use of reason. So mysticism is a third kind of knowledge, and what is it? It's based upon intuition and insight, direct intuitive experience, uh, as we saw from these previous two definitions. That's mysticism. Now, the reason I bring it up is because I believe that Calvinism's epistemology, its approach to knowledge, is actually a mystical approach to knowledge. And I think we can also talk historically about how that came to be the case. But let's define Calvinism uh, for starters. And the next couple of quotes here are going to come from the Center for Reformed Theology and Apologetics, CRTA. Uh, and, and if you go online, you can find out uh, a link to that in our epistemology outline. And in this quote, they're going to talk about the Calvinist doctrine of total inability or total depravity, as it's sometimes called. 
Uh, they state that uh, according to total depravity, man is unable of himself to savingly believe the gospel. The sinner is dead, blind, and deaf to the things of God. Well, if that's true, you're not going to be able to look at the outside world around you and reason to the conclusions about God because you're incapable of doing that according to Calvinism in terms of blanket statements. They go on to say that uh, the sinner cannot choose good over evil in the spiritual realm. It takes more than the Spirit's assistance to bring a sinner to Christ. It takes regeneration by the Spirit, by which the Spirit makes the sinner alive and gives him a new nature. And here's the key part. Faith is not something man contributes to salvation, but it is a part of God's gift of salvation. Faith is God's gift to the sinner, not the sinner's gift to God. So God puts faith in you. And we'll continue to sort of explore what that means here. Um, in the section on the efficacious call of the Spirit, or irresistible grace, as it's also called, the uh, CRTA goes on to state that the Holy Spirit extends to the elect, that is the chosen, uh, those who are destined for salvation, a special inward call that inevitably brings them to salvation. It cannot be rejected. It always results in conversion. And it says that the Holy Spirit is not limited in his work uh, by man's will. He's not dependent upon man's cooperation. The Spirit graciously causes, causes the elect sinner to cooperate and to believe and to repent and to come freely and willingly to Christ. The Spirit causes the sinner to believe. Now, it's starting to sound more and more like Calvinism is going to reject any ability that men have to look at the world around them and through reason deduce the correct conclusions and come to correct faith about Christ. And it's starting to look more and more like Calvinism is going to rely, having ruled that out of bounds, on upon, upon a Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit coming and causing a man, putting that knowledge and belief into a man directly, which is much more like what mysticism described, uh, a direct, intuitive, or experiential, subjective uh, a way to acquire knowledge of God because you can't get it any other way. The Orthodox Presbyterian Church is going to say it similarly. They're talking about the, the sinners and says they are not able to believe and be saved. It says, so total depravity means that we are born in unbelief and our state is hopeless until the Holy Spirit opens our understanding so that we can receive and believe God's word. Notice the idea of a direct experience through the Holy Spirit where he gives us understanding. Very much sounds like mysticism. R.C. Sproul, the famous R.C. Sproul uh, from his church's website, St. Andrew's Chapel, says uh, concerning God's effectually calling his elect, right? He says, God effectually calls his elect inwardly, that's a key mystical concept there, converting them to himself and quickening them from spiritual death to spiritual life. Regeneration is a sovereign and immediate work of the Holy Spirit, working monergistically. Grace is operative, not cooperative. So you don't cooperate in this process. It's something that happens to you that God does to you. But let's key in on a couple of the terms. It's an inward and immediate work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inwardly and immediately gives you knowledge and faith. It sounds like they're describing the mystical approach to knowledge here. Uh, concerning the Westminster Confession, so this is a very historically rooted document describing what Calvinism is. On their section on free will, they state, man by his fall into a state of sin is both has wholly lost all ability to will any spiritual good accompanying salvation. And it says, he is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself unto salvation. And that concerning salvation, in a separate section it says that man is altogether passive in the process. So there's not going to be any ability to prepare yourself beforehand by looking at the objective evidence and reasoning to it and pushing towards the correct conclusion. You can't do those types of things. You cannot take those types of steps toward correct faith because you're uh, made enabled by your sin and by your sinful nature. They go on here in this next segment to say, concerning the effectual calling in the Westminster Confession, that enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills. So this effectual calling, according to the Westminster Confession, involves an enlightening of the minds by the Holy Spirit so that you understand the things of God through this direct action of the Holy Spirit in taking place subjectively within you because you can't prepare yourself unto salvation in any way through reason and evidence. So we'll stop there and we'll come back in a second and talk a little bit more about Calvinism.